started or something. My God. <laughs> First time, sorry. <laughs> well, it, it wouldn't be anything re related to astronomy or astrophotography if it would be without any problems, right? <laughs> That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So, is this made oh, by SGP yeah. or something? This YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay we're live now we are live okay <laughs> then again uh so uh, hello out there uh, hello on on youtube um we're really happy for our premiere live session here it's called full moon live session because we thought uh we thought that uh no astro interested uh that the inter astro interested people can't do anything uh, under the full moon so that is good opportunity to have a little chat here uh, we are all related in some way to telescope service and this is also the platform we are streaming on uh, one uh, ambassador is uh, not already in the chat this is peter from south africa maybe he joins us later but anyway we will start we will start it and i have always a uh, uh, one eye on the chat here on the YouTube chat so um, that was also our question to you if you have anything to tell us or questions about equipment astro related stuff uh, maybe not so much images uh, itself uh, but yeah just just ask us and uh, in the meantime while we are waiting for some questions to roll in uh, we want to or I want to introduce you who is attending here and just some words of uh, some words from me and then I will go uh, give the, the word to, to the other guys here um, we are ambassadors from the telescope service that means we represent the company in some way worldwide so to say and yeah using their equipment of course and and uh, yeah pushing just uh, pushing the the visibility of the company a bit forward yeah yeah hello hello i can't write in the chat uh that would be a, a bit too much but uh yeah hello to you all that's great yeah 15 people watching and still counting up uh we had already a poll on instagram just i was so kind to to start a poll on instagram for questions i written them down and uh, I have them here and I will, before I give the word to you guys, um, there is one question, two questions are really often asked. The, the first one is, how did you get into astrophotography? What was the reason to get into that hobby? And the second one, what is the best entry, entry level telescope? So, and <laughs> If you can answer this in, let's say, two minutes or something, <laughs> then you're free to answer. If not, then yeah, just skip that question because I know we can talk, I believe, hours about what's the best entry level telescope. Uh, so, okay, I think I go clockwise. Then in my on my screen, Jasa would be the first one. So, yeah, <laughs> Jasa. <laughs> Uh, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Yasha. Um, I come from Slovenia and I'm 15 years old. Um, my, um, like, I say, um, interested in, in astrophotography uh, was last year or no, two years ago. Um, when I go, went to a safari with my friends and my physics teacher. And we had a lot of telescopes there because my physics teacher is also an astronomy um, teacher. So he has a lot of telescopes for any kind. Um, so we went there. Um, I was there more just for fun because my schoolmate was there too. Um, and one night that was clear um, this week, we went out to shoot something so i joined the team and we were shooting a not wrong andromeda galaxy and spare galaxy so m31 and m33 um and the single subs that were coming in were just like 
awesome because it was uh, water through so basically no light pollution and yeah this was the spark that got me into astronomy um and for me to recommend you what's the the best thing is to start it um is a small sky star tracker um like um sky water um or ioptron so I, I recommend sky water because i know that a lot of people have it and it's pretty good um and for like for getting photos to your um camera or and then putting it on social media um i recommend you to buy a used dslr um like i i started uh personally started with a canon 450d with a 8 8 inch newton because i got a pretty good deal for it um but for you to if you don't have a pretty good deal um i think that uh lens will make the best to for you to start the astrophotography and the kit ones the kit lens um aren't that expensive at all so yeah this is probably the best way to get in this um, hobby cool thank you that's great and we have to say uh if uh the people watching now don't know your instagram channel it is, they should have a look because uh you put so much content uh, high quality content to it that's great really really great to see that that curve going up that's cool um by the way i want to i just want to say uh if there are people from germany watching i think so uh feel free if you have questions also to answer uh, to ask them in in german that's no problem i will try to translate it so don't feel pressed to to try something in english here no problem so great before we come to the next one um yeah <laughs> another question was uh what is the best focal length but i think we should skip this for a moment because we have to we have to uh yeah keep it <laughs> tight some way whoa greetings back to dresden that's great <laughs> fantastic <laughs> okay um okay and uh, but another question mono or color camera maybe i will give my uh, five cents to this question i would say for the beginner a color camera maybe also a dslr dslm maybe if you have already one that's a good starting point also for everything what is broadband so something like uh galaxies moon planets you can definitely go with a color camera and you will be fine uh, when going to some more specific things like nebula narrowband photography when you're reaching the advanced level then i i personally would choose a mono camera or what is even better have both but yeah well we're talking in plenty of money so uh, that would be my suggestion okay so that looked good so far uh, i would say let iwan uh, introduce yourself please hey guys uh, my name is yuan i am part of the triangle of the bermuda <laughs> triangle of this meeting from eastern europe originally so yasa is from slovenia jan is from somewhere close and i'm from romania um i actually live in california i live in northern california right now so i'm kind of lucky to have really good skies unless the state is on fire. So um, I actually have been doing astrophotography for about two years. Um, I got into it backwards by uh, buying a big Ritchie Chrétien telescope, which is one of the hardest ones to actually get working because it's 2000 millimeters. Um, and I got it because my wife's actually a published National Geographic landscape photographer and she started doing Milky Way shots and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I've, I've always loved Hubble shots, the pillars of creation, the horse head. It's always been inspiring. So like, what can I do from home? Um, and it's been a journey, you know, it, it's been it's been amazing. The community is probably one of the best things you can find in anything. I think there's so much support. And even from retailers, I think that you have enough support that will, will help you kind of get there. Um, 
the perfect telescope for entry level. I put it in the background over here. Wait, where is it? Uh, it it's actually a, a TS Optic 61 EDPH. I think the second version is even better because it comes with better uh, color correction. Um, entry level depends. I mean, you can you can go from this is 270 millimeters to 500 millimeters, and you'll be fine. Um, star trackers are good. I think I love Skywatcher just like Yasha said. I think it's a really good um way to get in lenses is also okay I, I guess the thing is if you have gear use it and don't uh go buy really uh crazy gear until you know how to use it i think a small refractor is the best way to come in reflectors have a um a term that astrophotographers uh, hate which is collimation so do not get into astrophotography and learn collimation because it'll be a, a slap in the face um and i think that Color cameras are definitely the way to go, but I think that as any astrophotographer would tell you, there's a time for mono. You know, I think that mono is still one of the best ways to capture light. Um, and yeah, I think you can get, get great results with the DSLR, but like everybody else, when you're pushing to get more and more, you end up down the mono road and then mm -hmm. you start learning about things called filters and uh, names that shall not be mentioned because of pricing. Um, I'm just kidding. Astrodon, for example, is make some of the best filters in the world, and they are very, very good. So, with that, all of that said, I think that it's your personal journey. So, whatever you do, start it. We're here in the astrophotography community. There's many amazing astrophotographers. Just reach out to us. I think that we all can help each other. Um, that's it from me, Torsten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can share this. Uh, can share the, your last sentence. Um, the astro community, astrophotographer community, is really, is really good starting place. Somewhere on social media, everybody can ask questions, and most of the time, if the question is correct, then you also get a correct answer. That's always the case, definitely. <laughs> I'll see all day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, there was a question, uh, SC versus RC. What's your opinion? Yeah, so I'm also using a 12 inch RC telescope and I have also a eight inch SC. I think RC is, yeah, it is for astrophotography. It's better when you are all doing, uh, doing for example, only planetary photography or lunar, if anybody does that. Um, then an SC is absolutely fine. It's okay to use that, but for deep sky photography, an RC is a very good, a very good choice. Yeah, and we just add that if you want to use the SCT, use the white tubes. I've heard they uh, they actually work. Yeah. White tubes? Give, give yeah, me... there's 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 two brands of SCTs, <laughs> two large brands. One of them makes them white. Uh, and <laughs> that one, I think, is going to be the best bet. <laughs> <laughs> or, or do you mean the company that also produces the blue ones? The company that produces the blue ones, I've heard, uh, isn't isn't uh, the best. Uh, let's just say oh, that. Uh, okay. From, from prior experiences, let's just say. Oh, okay. Good to know. <laughs> okay. So, good. Then I think, Jan, uh, want you to introduce yourself okay so hello i'm jan i've been doing astrophotography since i would say 2015 when i purchased my first uh cheapo uh poopy newtonian which was more like a child's toy and it was like uh 76 millimeters by 700 it was on the az1 uh, mount so it was really wiggling you would just look at it and it would start to wiggle shake and you basically couldn't see anything through it and I just uh, one day pointed it at the moon and took a picture with my phone through the through the eyepiece and I was hooked and then several years later I have uh, two big telescopes uh, a mono camera modified DSLR and I just, it got really quickly, uh, really out of hand, in my opinion. <laughs> and, uh, also, I thought about the answer for the, what's the best focal length? Yes. Because 
whatever you shoot, uh, if it's wide field Milky Way, like the one I have set as a background, or if it's a uh, deep sky or planetary, it's always something you're gonna uh, you're gonna feel like it's incredible that you can actually take a picture picture of something you cannot see and it takes a lot of a lot of work to have really nice picture so it's really fulfilling that you and uh, as you guys mentioned already here uh, i think that the, this hobby has one of the nicest communities all around so so it's it's really great thing to to do also if you're uh, if you found some some people that are uh, as crazy as you so they love to stay up at night and uh, <laughs> then they just uh, all day complain that they, they need to sleep somewhere <laughs> and stuff like that. It's it's yeah. it's for you. And also, uh, I wanted to say how to start the astrophotography. I would say I always recommend people to try to search uh, for some astronomy forum in their own country because usually these forums have uh, some sort of uh, second-hand shop and you can get uh, good deals on a used equipment and it's really good to learn with it because it's it's cheaper it doesn't have to be that good but it can give you an idea the uh, how to use the equipment and then you can just go ahead and purchase something better uh, uh, and and new so I think first two years of my uh, astrophotography, uh, I was uh, following the rule that I will be doing it with just the cheap stuff and I, I'm going to have the great result. But then I realized that uh, I hit, hit the limits of this cheap stuff. So I started getting uh, triplets and mono camera filters and as I said, it got really quickly out of hand. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to, to kind of riff on what Jan is saying, and I think we'll all get there, is that it's great to buy used equipment. You know, I think, that, again, there's a lot of great equipment. But I think that there is a time where you say, OK, I'm tired of this back focus unknown, this corrective that nobody's heard of, this telescope that nobody has an idea what focus set to get. I think then you look at brand new stuff with, with better glass, FPL 53, 55, and then you understand that the newer telescopes are amazing and easier to use. So I think that you, you, you start from a secondhand scope, you kind of kill it. It's almost like a car. Your first car is never going to be the best. But then you come to a point where like I can do better. So I think, I think that's when you look at um, newer and cooler stuff. Yeah, that's also, right. also uh, you can have part of your equipment that's the bottleneck. So, for example, you, you, you can have the best telescope you, you, you can buy, and if you have really bad camera, you're never going to be satisfied with the images. Same vice versa. If you have really great camera but bad telescope, some really cheap uh, refractor, which which is achromatic you're never going to have nice images because you're, you're going to have a huge uh, huge uh, chromatic aberration so it's it's always finding the bottleneck like and trying to compensate for the rest of the stuff for example i had a triplet i had a mono camera but i had i had really old celestial mount and it would uh, I, I i used to say that it's waking up the neighbors because it was so loud when it was doing and uh, then I got the CM60, and it's it's day and night difference. So it's also also uh, uh, good to good to upgrade the equipment because it might be the bottleneck of what you can actually do. Yeah, there's not so much to to add, Jan. <laughs> to be honest. Uh, okay, some some words from me too. Um, I started astrophotography, let me remember. I started astronomy with the impact of the comet Shoemaker Levy 9 on Jupiter. If any one of you remember this, <laughs> it was 1994, I think. Uh, so, plenty of time go by since then. And I 
used a couple of telescopes since then. Also started with a very small Newtonian telescope, four, five inch Newtonian telescope. But it was great. It was fantastic. The first telescope and yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's just uh, fantastic. And then steadily always growing, but with, with, a, with a long break while studying and so on, uh, there, then I had nothing to do with, with astronomy, but it was always somewhere present. And yeah, now I have my second observatory equipped with a 12 inch Richard Cartier telescope. And yeah, I just love the, the hobby and to, to, to spend the nights there. That's fantastic to, to see new objects, new faint objects. I love photographing uh, galaxies. Yeah, so um, that's that's my profession. So and now I'm doing also videos for telescope service. And that's also really cool to yeah to to see the equipment real in real life and have my hands on it and and can do a review. That's really great. And that's also the, the point where I want to thank Telescope Service for the opportunity that you guys gave all of us uh, to be part of the community, a bigger part of the community. That's really great and we really appreciate it. That's just for that. Yeah, well, um, then let me go again to... Uh, by the way, uh, we can also show, share then some, some images from also of astro images from ourselves taken by ourselves um, I prepared something from me and maybe a few other guys have also something then we can share them um, let me switch back to the to the questions uh, according to being an ambassador there was a question of what are the benefits yeah I think we handle this shortly here there are benefits yes we get the equipment earlier and and have always a good contact with the with the people um, but uh, yeah benefits that's all we can say at the moment about that um, the one of the first questions in the chat was uh, how to become a brand ambassador yeah well I'm not sure how this worked for you guys um, telescope services always looking out for for new people and, and uh, more people to to uh, represent them but I'm not sure how this will work uh, precisely there's no precise way so just get in contact with, with telescope service and and ask what's needed and uh, what's the way to do this so okay That's so far for this. Uh, actually, uh, Thorsten, I think there was a great question that uh, Robert asked, uh, and he has to do a sampling. I think that too many of us are kind of down the rabbit hole of a small chip in a large telescope, thinking we're going to become Hubble overnight. <laughs> and um, it yeah. turns out it's not like that. It turns out there's <laughs> limits, uh, and it turns out there's 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 hard um, limits to these. So maybe we can we can ask. I think that was one of the greatest questions I've seen for a long time which is sampling right um, ah okay here yeah, I have it yeah, yeah yeah right that's right yeah maybe will will do will will you Arjan will do will you yeah, try to uh, answer it your opinion um yeah I, I think it's important to understand that your gear has to match right so your camera has to match your scope you cannot get a, a 183 Sony chip on the RC it just doesn't work like that you can't get a guide camera on a large scope as well. So I think the best advice is there are tools out there like CCD astronomy calculator that will give you um, the sampling rates will tell you depending on your sky because a lot of the times people don't understand but you're seeing is what defines your resolution. It's not your camera. So you can have 20 mm. megapixels, but if you have a bad sky and a bad sampling rate, you're going to end up with four. So there's a calculator online that you put your gear in and it will tell you if you're sampled properly or not. There, are, You can work on either sides. One will have to deconvolute your stars. Second is you're going to be careful about your guiding, but try to be in the best range for your sky. So if you're in light polluted skies, then you have to be, you have to have larger pixels. If you're in really good skies, then you can work with smaller pixels. But put your gear in there, 
see where you land. There's a little slider that tells you you're in the really bad or the really good, but make sure you have that because you, there, there are times when people really struggle with a with gear like that. So I think that's a good question. Yes, right, right. Um, and oh, well, you got it. What you had the website. Person can. Can I, can I just share the screen of what that Johan just said? Uh, yeah, sure. Feel free to share. All right. So um, here's the software, which I think that yeah. Johan mentioned. Um, where it's like, um, so I'll take my current setup, for example. I have a GWO 294 MC Pro. So its pixel size is 4.63. And my focal land on my Newton is 600 which gives me a resolution of 1.5995 i don't know um per pixel um so i think that this is probably um one of the like the best um pixel scale or pixel size or um, so that you can get what, what, what yasha is, t is talking about is the arc second per pixel resolution um and under calculators there's something called ccd as a calculator and that this will one. give you the cal so go into under calculators uh, yasha click on the top and there's a link yeah. there no no under calculators a second link yeah i'm just oh sorry yeah, I can't see is... oh, here yeah yeah okay. so ccd sustainability is where you go um and that will tell you you don't have to have a ccd camera by the way uh yeah so underneath here this explains everything so you just do like he did his camera uh, if you select your camera, you don't have to do that. And then don't be afraid to bin if you need to. We all bin on, on large telescopes, so. Um, yeah, so here's the seeing that you mm. also mentioned. Um, so let's say variable for seeing. Okay. Um, under my pixel scale. Under I'll five be... second arcs, uh, five arc second seeing, you may I won't do any astrophotography. But yeah, it's a, it's a good. Uh, a good good example definitely yeah no, that's that's all okay yeah exactly um there are many tools out there i want to when we are talking about tools let me show you another one which i like this is i can do oh <laughs> then i have to Okay, that's a bit weird now with all this sharing stuff. Just a moment. Um, this is called Telescopius. Ah, you guys, I think you know this. They have also a telescope simulator. That's not, uh, uh, not taking the seeing into account, to be honest. This is only the, the pixel scale. But it's also pretty nice to get an idea, you know, to get an exact value what your pixel scale is. And also for framing. I use this uh, highly for, for framing up my images. And yeah, as you see, I'm, this is my setup. I'm uh, exposing at 0.38 arc seconds per pixel. Um, this is highly, highly oversampled, but there's just no better, no, no cheap way to achieve a good sampling with a long focal length of C. You have to use a, a CCD camera with nine or 10 micron pixels, and this is, they are just, ex <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they are just expensive. <laughs> okay, um, that's just as a side note. Uh, if I may add something, uh, yeah, I sure. use. Uh, you just reminded me that the good, good uh, tool is uh, Stellarium, which is a free software, and it uh, you can control the telescope uh, in it and stuff like that, which I don't do, but I use it for planning. And you can also, if I, I just, I'm just gonna prepare it here, and I have to, I'll find some target. So give me a second and. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you. Uh, I use it for planning the uh, what I'm what I'm gonna shoot during the night. So I believe you should currently see what 
the Stellarium and uh, I use it for planning. Uh, I already said it three times. So uh, I have to set the uh, camera I use, which is SI uh, 1600 uh, Mono and uh, I have a, a ES photo line uh, 130 by 910 and I use it with focal reducer so the overall focal length is I believe 718 millimeters and you can use the uh, uh, Stellarium uh, for example because uh, when I'm applying, uh, planning what I'm going to shoot I have everything automated so uh, I have to know when the target is going to set and it's really good for example let's say I just finished shooting the California uh, nebula and I can just uh, see how how high in the sky it is it's around uh, 30 degrees and so I can now turn to the east and uh, try to find some new targets to shoot. Well, it's it's full moon tonight. So let's say I would shoot the moon, which I would never do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's really good for planning ahead because sometimes uh, when you when you don't know what the conditions will be or uh, when you, for example, are traveling and you're visiting some other country and uh, uh, you're just trying to do some uh, nice uh, white fields and landscape photography and Milky Way arch, it's really good for planning up ahead uh, to know what, what to expect and uh, what to prepare for or uh, what to prepare for some targets. Uh, I the most uh, use I got from it was when I uh, flew down to Chile and mm -hmm. I never been uh, I, I've never seen the southern sky before so it was it was the first time in so many years that I came out and I just looked up to the sky and I was completely lost <laughs> and I was so happy when I saw Vega and I, I, I just uh, it was upside down. It was so surreal for the first time to see the southern sky. <laughs> and it uh, really helped me to uh, plan ahead to align the mount to the octants uh, in the south because they don't have any any star right in the, in the center of the rotation. So it's really helpful and it's freeware. So uh, I would just recommend everyone to download it and play with it. Yeah. And there's a series of software you guys should look at it. Everybody uses different things, but I think to Torsten's point and to Jan's point, a planetarium software will show you what you're shooting and you can plan ahead. That's very important because you don't, you, you want to see what you're shooting. It's called plate solving. So that's how you know what's in there because these objects can be dim and you might not see all the nebulosity in 10 seconds or a minute or two minutes. So plan ahead and it's, you're going to be a lot better. Yeah, right. Um, by the way, uh, Stellarium is also available as a mobile as a website. Stellarium web, then you can uh, access this SkyChart software everywhere. That's really great. That's super cool. Yeah, right. Jasa, what software do you use for for planning or for for uh, yeah overview over the sky or what to shoot next or? Um, the one that Jan said and the one you said. Uh, so basically, when I look for targets that I want to shoot, um, I use the Telescopius um, because ah, okay. it basically shows everything that is out there, um, even the smallest nebulae or any dark nebulae, uh, basically everything. And then I try to, in the Telescopius, there is a, like a line on the bottom of the screen that shows you the coordinates where you're located. Um, so I type these coordinates in the Stellarium software and then plan ahead on where, when this is set or stuff like that. And I also like the Telescopia software because you can plan on the mosaics that you want to do. So like you can do a 10 by 10 mosaic. But, yeah, right. Um, That's right. I didn't see many people do that. Uh, um, 10 by 10 is hard. <laughs> Yeah, this is like the max that you can go, I think. Okay. Oh, you can check quickly. Um, yeah, like 10, 10 by 10 is the max that you can go. And also that you said, like, you can also see your sampling and basically it's pretty much straightforward for me. 
And the good thing is for me, um, like not for me, but for the guys who want, who are more like experimental and that want to um, explore more like an, on a scientific way, because you have plenty of different surveys. So yeah. I think that you mostly use the DSS colored, but there's like H alpha survey, infrared survey, gamma survey, and a lot of others that um, scientifically can really help um, to um, find something out there and like shoot it with a huge telescope. And yeah, right. That's right. Um, there was a question uh, from Forum Andy DCE. TS team, can someone help me with my TS GPU comma corrector? Uh, well, you have to, if you want to, please give some more notes what, what's happened. Maybe we can, maybe. Otherwise, if it's a real, if you have real problems with it, you can always reach our telescope service uh, for support. No problem at all. Uh, can you go over to the Edge HD 9.25 at F10? I'm not sure what Astro Carpets want to know about it. Does everyone, any one of you use a, a HHD or something, uh, some SC? No? Oh. Really? No one? <laughs> Can't I think, believe it. I think that we're all, um, I'll just make a joke. We're serious astrophotographers. <laughs> we do not use things for planetary soft uh, imaging. <laughs> uh, th those are only for planetary. I think. F10 is going to be slow unless you have a really high QE camera, even the newest chips, the 4040s, you're not going to see much. So F8 and lower and reducers always help. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, if that answers the question, maybe, but F10 is slow for deep sky photography. You, you I mean a G Sense 4040? Well, I was mentioning the chip. <laughs> no, I, I have a um, IMX 455. And the small ah, okay. Like okay. And in okay. the background is what I think Jan was saying, the, the CCDs, and you were saying about CCDs. Um, and those are extraordinary cameras still. But yeah. They are slow to download. The Moradin mm, in the background takes it's... 20 seconds to download the frame. And um, yeah, so th there's, there's every, you, if you know your gear and plan for it, most things will work just fine without too much hassle. Yeah. I, I have to say, I used three scs in the past and i also tried it at f10 uh, because there was question how hard is it to image at f10 and uh, yeah exactly as Aaron said it's super super slow just imagine uh, you stop down a telephoto lens to f10 and try to do deep sky photography any uh, nice. telephoto lens nice. it's super super hard you I have started imaging at f12 <laughs> max it off <laughs> yes, yeah. max it off with DSLR, sure. oh, Canon 100D, so the smallest one, and it's it's really noisy camera, and uh, at uh, F12 uh, on a AZ mount, so uh, I had really, really bad field shift, and, mm. <laughs> uh, oh, field rotation, not field shift, yeah. and... Uh, it was uh, I, I would uh, I would say it was like uh, self-inflicted uh, uh, like I was whipping myself it was uh, on a bed mount with a bed camera and mm. uh, with a telescope that's not made for that and I was doing deep deep sky so yeah. uh, I had to do like uh, 10 second uh, 10 second uh, exp exposures and it was really really painful but I actually managed to take a picture of the Eagle Nebula and the Eagle in the middle. Okay. And yeah. uh, at the time, at the time, uh, I was so proud of it because it, it was so incredible. Sure. Yeah. And uh, look, look, looking at it uh, now, it, it feels just so dumb to even try something like that. <laughs> but I was, uh, as, as I said before we started, uh, and we were here just me and Tosten. Uh, we were talking and I said that my astrophotography way is just multiple mistakes of uh, bad purchases and uh, I always learn something new with a bad purchase so mm -hmm. I just just recently I started buying the correct stuff I needed. 
Yeah, I think most of us uh, went this way. <laughs> most of us were struggling, and but if you like you uh, come over this point and and uh, decide for yourself now, I'm starting over now. I'm doing it the correct way. Then uh, the results were so much better. It was the same for me. Uh, having a crappy mount, a too heavy telescope, or not well well uh, constructed telescope, it's always always a pain. And then it's it's very easy to just uh stop it stop the whole astrophotography things yeah that's that's the point I, I think one more thing for beginners we cannot overemphasize the importance of not the telescope not the camera those are all important like number three and number four your mount is the most important thing get a good mount don't cheap out on the mount because then you will not see anything your your mount should be your prized possession Mm -hmm. And it will stay with you for a long time. It is it is important that it works properly because then if you can't guide, you cannot image. Yeah, that's right. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, Astro Carpets uh, added the point. I can't. Oh, no, I lost. Uh, I lost the track. Um... There was a question. Uh... What's better, Photoshop or uh, Optics oh. Inside? Oh, I haven't seen this. Um, this was a real, real question. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like the enthusiasm, Thorsten. Yeah, is this a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you want to um, start because you, you have an answer. It looks like. It. Yeah, of course. Um, well, but it's not that easy to to, to tell because uh, when you, in my opinion, it's all opinions, of course. Uh, when you start with photog astrophotography and have, for example, a DSLR, then Photoshop is an, a, a way to go, a way to start, my opinion. But if it comes to a more, if you want to go deeper in it, or when you do um, uh, filter exposures with a mono camera, then there is, in my opinion, no way around pics inside. It's such an amazing tool um just uh, a couple of weeks ago I, I i thought for myself well i can use pics inside i'm i'm good at it and then i saw a tutorial from adam from adam block and i want to burn everything literally it was so crazy to see how he uh, managed all these little things and there a pixel math and then whoops perfect picture that's really great and you you may achieve the same result with Photoshop, maybe, but then you involve a stamping tool and clone tool, and this is only the very, very last step in the processing. So that's, but that's my opinion. Now it's up to you guys to. I would say it's it's best to use both because uh, each of those them has its own perks. For example, in Pix Insight, you can do the convolution, you can do pixel math. You can uh, you can do everything basically in Pix Insight when you, when you can you can do stacking and stuff like that which you cannot do good in Photoshop. You can stack images in Photoshop, but it's not really good, mm -hmm. and it's not made for that. And uh, I use Photoshop mainly for the final touches. For example, when I yeah. want to play a little bit more with car colors or. Uh, for example, for uh, mask generation, because uh, so uh, sometimes I switch between PixInsight and Photoshop, because in PixInsight it's really difficult to do some really basic masks because you have to do them with mm, uh, sure, with yeah. a script or uh, with a uh, with a pixel math. So, and in Photoshop you can just, for example, when you need to mask up the some galaxy, you can just make an ellipse and boom you're done with a mask but in pix inside you would have to write the coordinates and everything to make an ellipse or you you have game script for that but it's mm. it's much more difficult to do masks in pix inside than in photoshop so it's good to switch between them and use the best tools in each of those softwares yeah and that, that's right also if i if i may uh i just found the eagle nebula picture oh, on my really? instagram it's yeah. it's really old i i could not find it on my computer so if i may share the screen sure it's... yeah we want to see it <laughs> <laughs> this is it in all its glory <laughs> f12 is this Hold on. f12 okay and that's okay 
it's I'm really proud of it and it's I believe maybe four years old maybe five and it was just in the beginning of my astrophotography journey and uh, I, I so, soon after that I realized that that's not really the way <laughs> to go. I, I liked your star reduction, yeah, and it's very good. Uh, it, 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 um, it's <laughs> you mean clip it all the all way to the Y? <laughs> I, I think it was at a time where I used just the uh, what's it called? Uh, I don't know uh, for stacking. It's uh, yes, yes. Sorry, did, did, did. Yes, 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 Deep Sky Stacker. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to edit the images in uh, uh, with the curves in the Deep Sky, st Deep Sky Stacker, <laughs> and mm. then I was all done. So it was it was long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. I can chime in on the on the last thing. So I don't want to upset Adobe because I am a designer and I used to work in Photoshop for the longest time for twelve years. But it, I think Jan has exactly, I agree with him and I do exactly the same thing. Learn your process and fix inside. There's plenty of tutorials out there. Ask people how they do noise reduction, deconvolution. The good thing about fix inside is you can copy the bottom left. There's a little script button and you can copy the text and give it to somebody and they can paste it in. Mm. So if you don't know noise reduction and somebody does, they can send you the actual script and you can paste it in. Photoshop, it's not made for this. It wasn't made for a lot of stuff, but people still used it. It's great if you want to do color retouches, camera raw filter is great, maybe uh, a few other things, but I think Fix Insight is the, is the right tool. So that's, yeah. I, I agree with you on that. I absolutely share this opinion. Uh, I used Photoshop in photography for, for many, many years and there's nothing else. There's just the one tool. But in photography, you can combine the both. You guys have any experience with Astro Pixel processor? It's it's much newer than PixInsight, yeah, and, and yeah. I heard just just the good things about it, but I have not come around to try it. Uh, unfortunately, I'm also I not. Have, in... I have... You have, Jasper? I have tried the uh, Astro Pixel processor, um, which is the um, not like not not uh, um, like if I used the Pixel so Pix PixInsight for the first time, I was using the Astro Pixel processor, so I didn't have no idea what I was doing. But I kind of managed to use the light pollution removal, and um, I was pretty impressed how it did that, um, because it was pretty much the same or even a bit better than the DBE in PixInsight. So it, the light okay. pollution removal is pretty pretty good in Astro Pixel processor, but of course it is, it, it is expensive, like Pixel said. Yeah, right. I I saw a video from from Astro Addict, um, and he introduced this Pixel Astro Pixel processor, and I uh, was also uh, uh, I also saw the this light pollution removal that worked really really good. Yeah, good to know. Uh, Okay, I wasn't aware that this also is that this costs money. <laughs> I, I never looked at it. It's better than DBE, right? Uh, Stardust Astro Robot. Okay. Then well, yeah. that's that's one thing I I would say the Photoshop is totally the worst tool, and that's the background uh, removal or. Uh, Removing I, the gradients from the background in Photoshop is, is so painful. I, I don't have an idea how to achieve this. Uh, 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 well, you 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 can uh, make uh, make uh, another layer and uh, set it to subtraction and just try yeah. to uh, yeah. try to match the gradient. But it's 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 not made for that. So mm. right, you yeah. always just clip out also some 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 nebulosity or some parts of the target you're shooting. So. In Photoshop, if you don't have perfectly flat field, it's it's mm. absolutely unusable. Right, and right. and not to dump on Photoshop too much, but I, I saw a question <laughs> earlier, and for those who want to do lunar photography, which is great, and you really don't have a lunar like a planetary camera, you can do it with a mono camera, and you just align it in Photoshop. You edit the channels. Photoshop's still good for that somewhat. I think it's just it's hard when you have to use like a gradient remover there was a tool you could buy yeah but what yeah. i did is create like a feathered mask and somewhat 
and use scripts to do that. I had it. I had it, and I bought it, and I don't remember what it was called, but it was uh, Gradient no Exterminator. More. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and also, there there was a, a tools a plugin, uh, Astro Tools, or something like that, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Angelo Peroni was pretty good for Milky Way. I think it's uh, it's Astro Processor or something. I think his name is Angelo Peroni, and his, his plugin is really good if you do a mm. landscape Milky Way. Mm -hmm. not Milky Way yeah. Yeah. Also, there was a question: What uh, what uh, acquisition software do you yeah, guys use? Yeah, right. That was the next question. Okay. Oh, someone should Nina. <laughs> SGP. <laughs> SGP all the way. <laughs> I, I'm gonna be the the snob here and say the Sky X, but that's because Whoa. the amount forces me to. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. From your, I think that's related to the country, isn't it? That you use the Sky. I, I the think so. Software Biscay makes Kayaks, yeah. Colorado, Cal yeah, um, yeah. the United States. But I don't want to say anything bad uh, about other software tools. I've tried. Mm. I have a license for SGP. I've, I've tried Nina. The thing I yeah. like about Skyx is that everything you guys talked about earlier about all of those, it's already built in Skyx. The Planetarium is built in there. Yeah. Your Mosaic tool is built in there. The only downside is it's not affordable. It's pretty expensive yeah. and it's made for semi-professional professional observatories. Um, but yeah, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. I also tried Nina, but with uh, not that good results because uh, it was just not stable. Sometimes the images were, uh, I don't know how to explain, uh, just not working. Uh, the camera connection was lost often, oftentimes, and but it's I, I like the idea behind um, Nina because uh, in my profession I'm a software developer and I'm writing C sharp software and this is Nina and you can check out the repository. You can build it by yourself if you want. That's that's cool. That's fantastic approach and I really appreciate that. But uh, for now uh, I stick with SGP and and use it until I'm really tired of it. Your reaction kind of describes my reaction to the user experience of all of these, except for the sky X, like I'll use it, you know, it's like Windows 95, it's fine. <laughs> um, but, but I think the biggest problem with these tools to kind of add to it, they're not really designed, they're just made. So yeah, that's exactly the, the point. Nina yeah. has a million panels that, and you know, I think it's, it's open source and the engineers have done a great job, but it's not really designed in the 21st century. It's more like early 2000s, 1990. Oh, you think so? Okay. Um, yeah, because yeah. you know, I, I I I design software all day long, and I think that it's it's convoluted in the sense that everything is there. Yeah. SGP yeah. as well. It's not really meant on what users mostly do, but like here's everything. Good luck. So. <laughs> That's the, yeah. that's the best definition of, of astronomy software. <laughs> Here you go. Good luck. Well, I, I actually emailed Software BSK once and sent him a design and said, I don't want a Cessna plane. I want a Honda. Can you make the Honda? I, I understand that you work with things that are complicated, but I don't have a dome observatory and I don't need the time displayed there when my computer already does it. So. I think it's evolving, and I think yeah. there might be a wild card on the on the way from a certain company that uh, has red colors as well, <laughs> and is European. So we'll see if they make the software. I'm I'm interested. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. I'm I'm really happy with the SGP, but uh, my girlfriend she she calls it the spooky program because because there's so many windows and so yeah. many settings so so when when she just sees i i use uh i uh control the telescope remotely via remote desktop so when it's opened and there's all the tabs and panels and stuff like that and the settings and she just she's just like and What's that? And I said, I don't know. I don't use it <laughs> because there's so many extra stuff. Yeah. But uh, as you guys said, it's 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 everything is there, but you just have to pick what what's useful for you and what's yeah, not. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm still uh, having an eye on Nina. I'm pretty sure that when the development continues, that it will will reach a good level. Definitely. And also the comments, yeah, many in the Nina game, yeah, okay. 
yeah, it's it's fantastic how they put all these features in it in a free software. That's really great. That's I also sure. we forgot to mention maybe the astrophotography tool. Yeah, which right. Was a right. Program I started with, but it's a, it uh, started to be too simple for me, and some of the features were uh, maybe just a little too complicated <laughs> to do than in SGP. Because once you set up SGP, you can just push a button and just forget about it, and then maybe from time to time just check it if it works correctly and. Uh, mm -hmm. In the morning, the telescope is parked. You have your image is taken uh, via different filters and stuff like that, and you can you can have a good night's sleep, which is which which is really important in this hobby. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, does anyone use, uh, has experience with Maxim DL? Uh, yeah. I have a few friends that use it, but yeah. not me. Okay. It's it's. I feel like besides buying S Big, which I think they did a great job on. <laughs> I think it's one of those um, jack of all trades and master of some, uh, not none, but I think having processing built in is kind of weird. And again, I, I played with yeah. Maxim DL6, I think the latest one. Okay. And it's yeah. it's uh, it's interesting, let's say that, but I yeah. don't know yeah. if it's for everybody. Yeah. Also, some of my friends use SIPS, which is made by Moravian Instruments, and but they're uh, astronomers and they just do variable stars and stuff like that. So I, I don't know if it's useful for astrophotography too. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, uh, just a moment. Hello, Peter. Oh, Hi fantastic! <laughs> Hello, Peter. Nice to Hi. meet you. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Nice. You too. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, maybe we have, uh, maybe I did something wrong with, with time. Um, we started a bit earlier. We had this uh, time shift from from uh, daylight saving time last night. So uh, I plan. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. So we are already talking uh, yeah, an hour now. But it's really cool that you join us. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I forgot about the time shift. So, so it's now the same time. Eight o'clock, eight p.m. Eight o'clock. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's no problem. Um, before I, uh, so just for you to to pick you up. Um, every one of us gave a little introduction about himself. So I will shortly give the word to you, that you may introduce yourself a bit. But I just want to continue shortly on on the last question in the chat. Tristan uh, said <laughs> ASIR is the way to go. And I agree with that because I uh, currently I am doing a review video for TS uh, for this ASIR. That's a really fantastic device, but um, it's a totally different story if, if you have a complex a complex telescope, maybe with a dome then ASIR just can't handle it. And it's limited to, not really limited, but uh, especially for the cameras, you should use a ZWO and ZWO filter wheel. So ASIR is great if you have a compact mobile setup or setup in your backyard, fantastic. But for an observatory, no, that's not. So, okay, that's just my, my uh, comment on this. So Peter, uh, feel free to introduce yourself a bit. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm based in, in Cape Town, South Africa. So right at the, the bottom of, of this vast continent. Um, my work is, is based uh, at the University of Cape Town. I'm actually a professor in cosmology. And um, I got into astrophotography mostly as a as a way of um, relieving some stress because uh, about three years ago or four years ago I I had to do a job um, in the university as head of department um, so a three-year term, term of office and I needed something to take the the edge off a little bit and it's something I'd always wanted to get into astrophotography was always something that uh, that had interested me and I'd followed various people on YouTube and, and uh, Instagram and I finally decided to take the plunge 
Um, and, you know, as we all know, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. Once you start, uh, it's very quickly becomes a bit uh, of an obsession. So I spend, I guess, um, you know, half my time uh, doing mainstream research um, and then a fair bit of uh, my spare time doing astrophotography now. So that's very briefly, you know, what... Uh... Hey, Peter, I had a question. And how, how is the stress working out? Uh, like, trying to reduce stress by doing astrophotography <laughs> is one of the, the most interesting things. Well, I've I mean, when you're, managing, when you're manage, man, managing a large department, you know, we, ha we have something like, um, it's, it's about 34 academics, and then, you know, a lot of administrative staff um, and auxiliary staff so it's it's getting on to close to 100 people that you're managing um, so that, that was a big job for three years um, I'm done with it now so I finished it uh, uh, just over a year ago and um, I had a nice one-year sabbatical which was great unfortunately the sabbatical coincided with uh, coronavirus and lockdown mm. so I spent the sabbatical at home um, oh no uh, so, which, is, which was a huge, huge shame because I had plans to go to the UK and to uh, to Germany and to Italy and and, and possibly also a trip to um, to the US. So, all of those those trips were cancelled, and um, I, you know, I was I was stuck at home. So, you know, it was it was it was great in a way because I, you know, I could focus on research, but uh, it also gave me gave me the opportunity to think a bit bigger with with the astrophotography um, so I built you know I, I, I got together with a with a small building company and, and built a little observatory which is uh, now sitting just uh, outside the on the deck um, outside this room on the deck so so that's made my life a lot easier I don't have to set up and tear down every night it's now basically you know the press of a button and I can get going, which is fantastic. Great, yeah, good to hear. Uh, good, good to hear that you can uh, now do some more in astrophotography, but it's really hard with your sabbatical. That's that's hard to hear uh, that everything yeah, well, crashed. I, I, I best of best of a, a bad thing, you know. That uh, yeah, right. I had plenty of time, you know, with a family as well, and and caught up on research. Um, wrote some papers and mm. uh, and then and I also had a lot of free time you know so yeah uh, which was nice yeah. so now I have to give a shout out to the new arrived viewers here uh, to the recently arrived viewers unfortunately we had a obviously a little problem with the time shift that occurred last night so now we are at 193 visitors uh, watchers which is great. This is fantastic. Um, so the next session uh, will be planned a bit more precise that everyone is joining at the same time. <laughs> okay. Also, just uh, I'm sorry, Peter, I just got your message that you were in the lobby. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I also saw that. Saw. That's the Peter, thing I always forget about Zoom. I've, I've made the same mistake. Um, you know, I start a meeting. Uh, and then I forget to let people in, so it's uh, it's a common thing to do. Uh, Peter, I know we all talked about this, um, and here's the question: How did you? What was your first setup, and what what software do you use to image? Um, well, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be gifted a, a, a Celestron um, eight inch um, uh, to to start off with from my my father-in-law. It was it was definitely the wrong telescope to start off with. Um, and um, it was on an alt as mount as well, uh, so it was, it was mostly visual. But it's photo was photography that I wanted to get into, so um, I very quickly sold this telescope and uh, bought myself a TS uh, eighty millimeter um, ED refractor, um, and um, that's essentially you know changed things a lot for me because it made my life a lot easier i learned was able to learn the art uh, um, a bit uh, a, a bit better and uh, and then from there you know i've moved back into imaging with uh, you know with uh, an edge hd uh, 800 and um, various other telescopes but definitely a smaller telescope to start with is the way to go 
Um, it's mm. much easier. It's much less demanding when it comes to guiding and uh, all these these things that we have to worry about. And uh, um, it's a, you know it's some, some, something I would I definitely recommend that people do. They start with a small telescope, a sixty or an eighty millimeter telescope, and then go from there. Yeah, that's right. Otherwise, the the hurdles are so high, and the the, the disappointment is also much bigger when when you yeah just go full in with a with a super large telescope and spend much money on it, and then it, it seems that it's not performing good. But most of the time, it's not the telescope, but it's uh, yeah you are not used to it. That's definitely a thing. Peter, what I am really curious about, um, is there any way for you to combine your profession uh, with your astrophotography? Is there any connection or is it really uh, one is the theory and the other is, side is the, the practical thing? Um, look, there's the mainstream research, which is very separate from, from, from the astrophotography, but um, I do use uh, you know, the, the, the hobby now to do a lot of outreach. Um, so I connect with schools. In fact, I had a session on uh, Thursday with a, with, a, with a school, a local school, where I talked about astrophotography and we were able to sort of zoom into my, uh, into, my, into my observatory and I gave people a guided tour of what I had there and showed them some pictures, gave them an idea of you know, what, you know, what it takes to produce a, a nice image. Um, and I'm teaming up with other schools as well. So the idea is to try and, you know, bring astronomy to the general public, and, and in particular young young people, people that are coming through through the schools, and who are interested in space. Um, and you know, this is definitely a way of getting into, um, you know, into astronomy and and, and mainstream research. Uh, in fact, you know, if I, if I think back when I was a teenager, I did have a telescope. When I was a teenager, it was all visual in those days, um, no photography, and then I didn't do any kind of visual astronomy at all until um, much, much later. Until I, you know, had established myself um, with the career, you know, with the scientific career, and then had some more mm -hmm. time and a bit of money to go back and and get back into into the hobby. Okay, sounds great. That's a fantastic approach. I like that. If I can contribute, also, uh, for example, I have I have a lot lots of friends that do astronomy and are actually astronomers, and uh, some of them sometimes they measure variable stars and they tend to shoot uh, or measure them near some more famous objects. So they also have uh, in frame, for example, the crescent nebula, nebula and stuff like that. But uh, when I try, uh, when I, uh, my friend asked me, like, uh, Jan, you have lots of data. You must have some some really good uh, var variable stars there. Uh, can I can I just uh, take a look at the data? Uh, we find out that uh, I take too long uh, exposures too long, so all the stars mm. that could be measured are are in saturation. <laughs> so it's not useful for the science scientific community but which is a shame but i think it's also as peter said a really good thing uh, for influencing younger people to be more invested uh, not just in astronomy but overall in science and uh, that's more important than ever i think so it's yeah, a really good tool for uh, for making science interesting and I, I just to add to that if we make one person believe the earth is not flat I will be the happiest person in the world because I've been asked that when I was showing my, astro my astrophotography, if the earth is flat. And I was like, if we have this, if you ask me this question, how am I photographing that disc that's the moon over there? What, how is that a disc? So I think um, expanding this to other people, telling them that the universe is so beautiful, showing them all of this will open their eyes and kind of understand the kind of vastness that's out there. And we just see a very, very small part of it. So I think great job on that peter i'd love to see how you help other people and if i can use my gear to help you out do it in yeah no, i think uh that would be great uh, you know teaming up with various people and i think this has been one of one of the the positive things about about the the pandemic is is we've learned how to communicate you know yeah. through different mediums and um and you know i can connect with a school virtually 
and do as good a job i think um that way than i would you know if i, if I were there physically in fact i can do more because i can I can, you know, I can, I can jump into my observatory. I can, you know, and I can't do that so easily from the school. So, um, although I should say that very soon, this e e that will be possible because I'm putting an automation module into the observatory, which will allow me to open and close the roof um, via my PC, fully automated. At the moment, I have to press a button to open the roof. Um, mm -hmm. Um, but so in principle, I'll be able to go out to school anywhere, you know, in the country and run imaging sessions from that school, um, fully live, which is, uh, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. That's if there's anything positive in the, in this current situation, then this is, uh, is it the connection between the people? It's so, so cool to, yeah, to just have a, have a chat, uh, have to chat around with, with people connected all over the world. That's fantastic. Just look at us. We were from South Africa to America to Europe, yeah. so all over the world. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, uh, I think we have answered most of the questions. Um, Bernhard asked... I had one more question, maybe it's, sure. it's just more of a personal thing for each photographer before we show images and stuff. It's like, yeah. what's your favorite telescope? Well, what's your favorite imaging gear? We all have our favorite child in that sense. So what, what, what's your favorite for you guys? That's hard. Thorsten, you're not going to say DSCP, <laughs> are you, Thorsten? Please don't no, say No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. But it's... Uh, from this blue company I mentioned before, um, they they had a no. It's not especially for me. It is a 127 by 950 millimeter apo refractor. Um, this is also sold from Omegon and yeah, well, I believe it's from Sharpstar originally. <laughs> as every refractor, I'm not sure. But um, I had this telescope a couple of years ago, and I equipped it. Uh, despite it's not a perfect telescope, but I used it with a three inch uh, flattener reducer. Then it was at 700 millimeter focal length. That was perfect. It, I connected a Canon 5D to it. Full frame was perfect. Really, I, I loved it, but I had to sold it. And yeah, now, now I'm completely on the, no, not completely, but now I'm a C guy. So, but this, this, if I had to buy one telescope for my life, then I may, it may be this one. <laughs> okay. Jan, what about you? Uh, well, I, I would say it's a telescope. I, uh, oh yeah, yeah, you can hear me. Sorry, I thought I was muted. Uh, uh, it's a telescope I have now probably because it was a real game changer. I thought that uh, stepping up from triplet to triplet with FPL 53, is not going to be such a different, but it was such a huge difference. And the resolution I'm getting right now is, is absolutely amazing. So I'm, I'm, uh, I feel like uh, currently I finally got to the point where I'm satisfied with the, with the stuff I have and I don't feel like upgrading anytime soon. So mm -hmm. as I said, uh, as I told uh, Thorsten, uh right now the next big thing is going to be the remote observatory because uh, i finally have something i can live with for a long time and also i would mention from a uh, lenses the samyang uh, 135 f2 mm -hmm. which is okay. a beautiful uh, for the price it's absolutely huge bang for the buck uh lens so it also it's a good way to start as we were discussing before the small style trackers you can just use it with a dslr and this lens is absolutely gorgeous yeah right yeah so what's your favorite telescope come on tell us um yes yeah, so don't say drc yet, on... yet. Don't say DRC yet. <laughs> um for the scopes i have probably have all the types of the telescopes that come from the sct to the newton apochromatic um, and I have to say that um, a Newton and an apochromatic that I have at home, um, they're like you—you you can't miss it. I have the T 
TS61 EDPH, the old version, which is a doublet. Um, and even though it's a doublet, um, I get pretty um, pretty good shots with it. Um, I have a problem with it when, when focusing on a dual band filter because I have an OC one shot color camera. And so the red channel and the blue and the green one have the different uh, focusing points. So I get a bit of halos around the stars in the R channel. Um, and I had two Newtons at home. Uh, one is um, 200 uh, and 800 millimeters, so F5. And I have had, I have now, which is the TS Photon 6 inch, um, so 600 millimeters focal length and 150 diameter. And I just, I, I love it. Um, and I have at home the SCT, which I didn't have much luck with it because it was the from the blue company. Uh, um, I mean, <laughs> they 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 made it pretty good for planetary, but definitely not for the deep for the deep sky yeah. because um, at I didn't have plate moving, so finding stars at two hundred millimeters focal length was um, hard, and F ten was also pretty um, bad so I couldn't even take any pictures with it because also I didn't have the proper back focus so um, it was really hard to even collimate it because the stars were um, elongated all over the field um, so yeah, and I also I haven't had an RC at home yet yet um, but they 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 are beautiful like the design is just beautiful and so yeah I've, i love the apples and the mutants so far from my experiences peter cool. uh, that, such a tough question really <laughs> um at, at the moment a i've got a, a, I've got a, a little you know a, to a dual rig setup which is made up of the samyong um uh 135 f2 lens um and then with it, the 61, the ED, EDPH 61 millimeter. Um, and I love that combination. So basically, I can, I can run them simultaneously um, on a target, and I get the very wide field view, as well as the, the more zoomed in um, image of a target. So that's nice to have that comparison. You know, to, uh, and the quality, as Jan said, the quality of the Samyong is, is amazing. You know, once you get that back focus right, and it is a bit tricky, you know, I was playing around with um, 0.2 millimeter um, spaces just to get the perfect back focus. But once you've got that back focus dialed in, it's, it's fantastic. It really is an amazing lens. Um, uh, and I've been very happy with the, the 61 EDPH um, as well. That's the newer one. It's the, the the, uh, the second generation. I've been quite impressed with that. So that double rig I'm very fond of. Um, and then I think the uh, the Rasa 8 uh, I've used a lot over the, over the last uh, year. Um, and the, you know, the rate at which that telescope um, grabs data is absolutely amazing, um, especially for narrowband. So for narrowband, it's great. So like, you know, you can get away with, you know, two minute ex exposures for H alpha, um, and you know, typically 60 seconds or, or less for O3. So to generate, you know, bicolor or um, double palette images with the Rasa very quickly is, uh, is amazing. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, what I would like to do is combine the Rasa with you know, the say the 94 millimeter EDPH because that telescope mm. has got roughly the same focal length. So I can do color data with, with that refractor because I, I tend to find that refractors are much better for for gathering um, uh, bull band data uh, and then use the RASA pretty much exclusively, exclu ex exclusively to ga gather the uh, narrow band data and then combine. And because they are, you know, they are the same focal length, and I'm, if I use the same similar camera, or the same camera with the, the same pixel size, then I, you know, it's a, it's a great way of combining data. Um, 
so i think at the moment that's you know that's those would be my favorite telescopes although for more challenging projects the uh, the edge the edge hd 800 is is also a great telescope although i find there you know the conditions are absolutely critical you know you need to have good seeing um mm. and what i'll often do is i'll you know when i've got that telescope operating in the observatory you know i'll, I'll you know i'll get it going and within five or ten minutes i, I have a center a good idea of whether it's worth continue continuing with that telescope because seeing plays a, a critical role um you know when you're when you're imaging yeah. at that that focal length um, right. so it's uh, uh, so so it sounds like a lot of people are are there's like a three to three to one for refractors here and um <laughs> I, i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna go with what yasha said i actually um love the rc uh, nothing comes close to resolution nothing comes close to complexity um nothing comes <laughs> close to collimation well I'll, I'll say nothing but I'll, I'll i'll add to that and i think that the images you get at 2400 2000 millimeters are mind-blowing if you have the patience and i say yeah. this if a lot to actually get it working it is mm -hmm. a stunning telescope mine's ts optics so it is um was one of the hardest things to get working because again uh, resolution second is i have the dream like peter does of getting a really fast scope that can mm. cover a full frame sensor yeah, unlike the celestron uh, the smaller ones but also collect data quickly so i got the bug and i bought a takahashi epsilon 160 it's an older telescope it's it's probably as old as i am from the 80s um so um i i got it i got it working but tilt is the death of these telescopes the faster your telescope is yeah. the harder it is to get it perfectly flat and i'll say that because 0.1 millimeters in a corner will show as distorted stars yeah so yeah. fast telescopes fast optics will always come at a price it's almost the price you but have you, to pay yeah, for you for can this. mitigate that a little bit by using slightly bigger pixels admittedly admittedly you'll be you'll be a little bit under sound under sample so what i found is you know I, I i sometimes struggle a little bit with tilt uh with the 1600 um the asi uh 1600 um camera um and i found that when i moved over to the 294 the slightly bigger pixels the problem went away and then you drizzle you drizzle the data and you get fantastic results so you can mitigate it somewhat by using a little bit slightly bigger pixels i the only good image i got out of the epsilon was with the camera over there the moravian which is six micron pixels uh, six micron per pixel and that's really yeah. big and again you could probably kick the mount as it's imaging and it would make a difference yeah. <laughs> because it's such a large pixel so that's a very interesting point that you brought up here mitigating error through larger pixels that's that's very yeah cool. you don't you don't want to make them too big but you know, the, the 294 <laughs> i think it's 4.6 uh, uh, nanometer Six so three. it's it, it's um it's a little bit bigger than the you know 3.75 mm. pixels um but you know big enough to to get rid of the problem also, uh, you guys reminded me a question I get a lot, which is, uh, what's the best type of telescope? And it's really hard to uh, respond to those, these questions because there's no real uh, overall best telescope because yeah. uh, there's always some catch. There's always something that the telescope is worse than the rest of the types. and uh most people are trying to find something that that's going to be uh usable on everything and it's going to be just perfect so and also cheap <laughs> don't forget cheap so uh, it's, it's really hard for uh for someone to to uh, respond to these questions like uh there's no real best telescope but uh i would say that uh for example for the be beginners the uh refractors are the best way to go because you you don't have to collimate anything mm -hmm. uh you can just uh when you transport it there's you can just uh set it up and uh you you have it running and you you don't have to bother with collimation and you don't have to bother with uh 
uh, stuff just falling inside on a on on a mirror or something like that. So so you don't have to disassemble it for cleaning from time to time, and you just blow the dust off and you're ready to go. So I would say the the most user friendly telescopes are refractors, but uh, like I said, when I started, uh, there's no best telescope. And I get this question also a lot, like, like we are talking, like, uh, what, what telescope should I buy? And what's the best? Best yeah, telescope right. is the one you use the most, <laughs> I think. Oh, the, anyway. yeah, yeah well, the that's, one that's, that's very good you answer. Learn. Okay. Um, well, I think we can... We have still some questions here, but uh, if you all want to, we can share some images, I think, to show the people what we are doing. We are talking always about uh, astrophotography, but, oops, sorry. Um, but now I think it's time to show some results if you want. Who's going first? I don't know. Uh, I, can, I mean, I can go if nobody wants yeah, to go. Yeah, sure. Feel free. Well, we should just nominate people and see how they feel. <laughs> so I'm going to apologize for the weird aspect ratio of my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Oh, my God. Uh, well, yeah, we can. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a little bit wide. Is this 16 that. by 5 or? It's 21 by 9. It's oh, a 38 yeah. inch. Okay. Wide so okay. It, it helps. <laughs> it, so, it, sure. Uh, I want to say that, Jan, your image is better. I, I, I tried. I really tried to fight this uh, with the Eagle Nebula. This is actually <laughs> one of the first images that I really liked taking uh, with the RC, Latias Optics RC. It's got a lot of issues. We all know this. But the detail you can get at 2,000 millimeters, you know, and this is bin. This is bin 2 by 2 uh, And then I got the resolution back through Drizzle. This is my Eagle Nebula with uh, in narrowband. Um, this is the fishhead nebula as well. This is at the bottom of the heart nebula. This is, I usually expose for a long time, 20, 30 hours to get the results I want um, because I was also using a CCD um, and also really long exposures around 30 minutes per, per uh, image. And yeah, I think that you just have to work for it and understand that you need to wait. Astrophotography doesn't happen overnight. Even with the Raza, you have to wait. Um, this is actually, I, I placed a bet with one of my friends that I could take a decent image of Orion from my backyard in a Bordeaux 7 with no light pollution filters. So we both did an image and uh, no light pollution and it came up pretty good. It's with a refractor, a Orion 140 DX2 refractor. Um, it's about eight hours. The core is kind of weird because I did a double shot and then I, I, photosh I masked it in Photoshop. But for a Bordeaux 7, I, I was really happy with it. It wasn't that bad. Um, this is one of the ones I like, an object that I'm reshooting now with, uh, with my new CMOS camera. It's Milot 15. It's in the middle of the um, Heart Nebula. It's, it's a very beautiful object. And this is about 28 or 30 hours. And now I'm going for 15 hours with a CMOS sensor um, QHY 600. And the detail is stunning. I think it's a very beautiful object, and I think that it's it's also incredible. Um, this is actually one of the latest photos that I just finished. It's um, it's using the Richie Cretian 12-inch uh, TS optics along with the QHY 600. This is about 10 hours, and this is what I was really stunned uh, about the settings and and actually getting it properly done with the proper read mode. It's really good. And the oxygen rendition on these newer CMOS sensors is stunning. I think that with oxygen three is always, it's like pulling teeth. It's always going to be noisy and bad. Yet in this situation, I was really, really impressed about the detail that I could capture and just the amount of data in such a short time. And I think lastly, I, I've shot the rosette many times, too many times, according to my wife. <laughs> and uh, so this is another part of the rosette, which is at the bottom of it, if you're looking from, from the North American side. And I really like shooting really, really up close objects with the RC, just to give you an idea of depth. And I was actually inspired by one of the shots uh, Dustin Gibson took with uh, a large CDK of the rosette. And I was like, can I come close, right? 
Um, these people have been doing it for a long time. They're experts. So my goal was to kind of come as close as I can to these really amazing people in the astrophotography community. Um, and I think lastly is the Sol Nebula. And I think that there was a much better shot of this that won an APOD. And I was really close, but uh, it's just, I think you have to challenge, your, challenge yourself every time to do something different. And this is what I think for me, the RC really comes into its own. Having that resolution, having that deep view and seeing small clouds that probably are bigger than our solar system. I think it's, it's amazing. So that's it for me, guys. I'm an out of band fan and uh, that's what I, I love to shoot. Wow, fantastic, really. Uh, I. Uh... I was thinking of uh, not showing my images. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That's really impressive. Uh, well, Jan, would you continue? Uh, just give me a second because uh, I uh, I have a really messy file system in, <laughs> in my computer. And so it's really hard to find the new ones. And it's it's always I, I always pick the same name and I cannot name the folders with the same name. So I add something or replace something and then i get uh, get confused what what's uh, what's new what's not yeah. what's, what's processed what's not processed what's pro so i i keep changing the the uh i keep changing the uh name and filing system and it's mm. it's just i think it's getting worse and worse <laughs> And I guess the Astro bin, yeah, and show us Astro bin. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, ha I have a couple of images open up in Astro bin because it, it's, it's more, <laughs> it's simpler, but I wanted to show you also some of the, some of the uh, other images, but if, yeah. if I, if I may share my screen. Or... Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so here's the uh, M42 I took the most recently, I think. And uh, you, you, you can see what's really bad about the SI 1600, and it's the, it's the yeah. star here. This yeah, and the micro, yeah. mi micro lensing, it's, it's just really bad. But this was a project I was uh, trying to take for a long time, and I was planning on getting like 10 hours per channel and just doing the RGB and I ended up in one hour per channel because uh, this winter was such a bad weather mm. that I just couldn't shoot but it came out uh, I would say I'm, I'm really happy with it how it came out for the time I, I spent on it then I picked the melot and also it's uh, all these images are taken with a new telescope I, I'm saying new but I got it almost a year ago but uh, I haven't had enough time to play with it that much and uh, I really love the resolution uh, here's the crescent nebula mm. and uh, also I finally yeah. got the bubble soap nebula here Fantastic! And yeah. this one's really faint so I'm really happy that it popped out this much on, on this image uh, here's my Rosette Nebula, but it's the older version, so you can see with the older telescope that the resolution was just not there, that the, the refractive index of that telescope was too, too, too high, so uh, even though I had a good camera, good mount, I just couldn't get the resolution I wanted, so also when I... Uh, oh, here's the Dark Shard Nebula, uh -huh. and it's it's uh, I, I love dust clouds so it, it's it's my most favorite target uh, are dust clouds so also this this picture won me the Czech astrophotography over a month so I'm really proud of this picture and it's also taken with the older telescope and I think so are the rest of the here are dead poles which are my favorite and mm. uh, also one of the targets I was planning on reshooting this year but we just had three months of cloudy skies, so I wasn't able. So we this do, is, yeah. This is uh, one of the rare uh, Milky Way shots from Czech Republic where there's a uh, sky glow because uh, here in Central Europe, we don't have that many dark sky locations. And I think Czech Republic has, uh, has uh, I think, Bordel three or two is the limit and there's no real dark sky in Czech Republic so it's really hard to pick something uh, with decent skies and you can see it was taken 
next to a small village, but it's also so like polluted here in, in a village. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's really hard to find good location. But uh, this one was was quite satisfying. And here's uh, Ro Opiuchi, which is my most favorite target. And I took it in, back in Chile. And unfortunately, I haven't had uh, my camera modified back then. So the Red Nebula just didn't pop at all. But I was still pretty satisfied with it. Because uh, here in Czech, uh, it just over, uh, it's just over horizon, so it's really hard to shoot. But uh, as you said, uh, if I go to Astrobin once again, I forgot, I'll show you my most recent image because I said I, I love dust clouds. And here's a, here's a Polaris. And, oh, uh, wow. It's just it's taken with the uh, F2 lens with the Samyang I was mentioning and just on a star adventure and it's it's around eight hours I think with uh, with exposures of two minutes and I was surprised how much the dust just popped out so this is stunning I mean yes. thank yeah. you like uh, the Polaris uh, not many people shoot it because they they think it's just, just, just Polaris so. Why yeah. would I shoot it? I, I I'm just gonna align my mount, but it's <laughs> there's so many much stuff there. So really great work. images, yeah. Um, let me continue. Um, I think yeah, how so that you can also see it. Just a moment. It's always critical when recording, sharing, and something else all at the same time. So, um, as I said, I'm more for galaxies, or I love galaxies. And here are a couple of them. Uh, this is, for example, NGC 2903. This is also the TSRC 12 inch. Uh, this one here with the very simple CCD 47 reducer, so at 1600 millimeter focal length and yeah I'm not oh by the way no I'm not have the and I'm also not that long integrator I'm trying to capture multiple objects per night honestly which is not so good I know but yeah that's for the moment my way of working you have and three galaxies in this field right Thurston? Uh, there are more, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, there are so many of them showing up. Then all of these little, uh, this one here, definitely. Yeah. And yeah, there's so, m so many things showing up when you're integrating deep. That's great. This, and uh, by the way, I'm photographing the ARP catalog. I'm not sure, maybe you heard, uh, yeah, you definitely heard of it. A catalog of 338 peculiar galaxies uh, mostly on the northern horizon down to minus 19 degree declination and these are all below 13th magnitude I think uh, yeah something around that uh, the dimmest is 16 17th magnitude so very challenging targets and I picked some of the deeper integrations for example this is taken with the 294 MC for four hours and this is ARP 81, really, really tiny things. This is, I believe, something three arc minutes on the long side. So really, really faint and small. But yeah, I just like these things. And as you all already mentioned, it's really depending on the seeing. With, with the fo long focal lengths, there are nights that you just can't use. It's not possible because the stars were super large uh, but this night here was really good so then we can go uh, one can go for for these targets yeah the well-known m51 isn't it frustrating when it's clear skies and you cannot shoot absolutely um, uh, there was a time when I set up my little um, 76 EDPH on top of the RC to be able to capture something because with 300 millimeter focal lengths there's always uh, room for photos, but um, it's not that that rigid. This combination, the the 
the movement is too too high in the system so i i uh yeah this dismounted this again yeah piggybacking telescopes is one of Pig the hardest things yeah yeah, yeah. flex right. chair always gets to you right and here we have also a deep integration of ngc the fireworks oh no the, the name is up there six nine four six the fireworks galaxy yeah i just like this and this is a very challenging target because of the the surface brightness is so low um this was integrated 75 by four minutes something around five hours that was so hidden uh, behind the milky way right yeah right it's in the in the galactic plane so uh, hidden by yeah the stellar uh, the, the galactic dust uh, another super deep integration. I'm not sure what magnitude this is. Op 145, this one here. Also an interacting galaxy, this ring galaxy and this elliptical here. Uh, very, very deep integration. And there was just nothing coming out. Uh, yeah. But this, uh, I saw this in, in the morning after, after this exposure. And then I processed it. But there's just n not more to get. I think you got a really amazing shot just because it's next to a star. I think that, yeah. yeah, this is amazing what you can do next to such a bright star. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is one of my favorites. It's called the Tadpole Galaxy. There are some tadpoles in the sky, but uh, this is the Tadpole Galaxy. This is a bit famous because Hubble took an image of it uh, some years ago and it developed this large tail here and with, with real high resolution. This is a fantastic image. But this is really the limit, I think, of, of my setup. This is now, yeah, okay, this is a really short exposure, 17 by five minutes. I will add color data to this, uh, I think, yeah, as soon as the weather allows it. Because it's- so many galaxies in that image. Yeah, yeah, right, that's- <laughs> Here we have some little, little tiny things. Most of these very, very dim things here are galaxies. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's sometimes a good thing to annotate an image in a pixel site once you pl uh, plate solve it and then hit yeah, annotation. Yeah, I, I do it, this regularly. You, yeah. You get so many things you didn't know that there were. So it's, yeah, it's really yeah. fun to do when you're doing galaxies. Like oh. The, it's also a galaxy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what I'm also trying uh, in, in deeper images is to get my limited or my, my deepest magnitude I can achieve some of a personal challenge, something of a personal challenge. Um, this is also quite interesting how, how deep one can go. Uh, this is also one. Uh, and these, these ARP catalog images I do mostly in luminance because I'm just too lazy. And, and for this faint ones, there is just no, or I can't get color out of it with a decent uh, exposure time. I had to expose many, many hours for the color uh, to bring this uh, to bring this out. So I decided to to stick with luminance. Have you, have you tried to bend the color um, and keep the luminance um, at max resolution? Yes, uh, I tried. I was not that um, that happy with binning this ASI 1600 I'm using. Uh, for CCD, no, uh, no issue. Of course, uh, I would have been it, but with the CCD, uh, with the CMOS, was not working that way. But I will try this again, uh, at least for reducing the amount of data, because it's just not needed. This is so highly oversampled that image, uh, so one by one is just not needed. Yeah. This is stunning. The amount of galaxies you can capture there. Yeah, yeah, and. But what I also did last year, summer last year, was using this uh, 76 EDPH uh, quite a lot. And I was super happy with, with I never did a wide field uh, narrowband before. I just didn't, it. I don't know why. And then I used my ASI 1600. I put it into observatory onto my EQ8. So everything was automated and I can, I was able to capture some hours of data and yeah here the crescent and i also looked for the uh how it's called soap bubble 
this, yeah. this bubble here. But in my uh, with, with the starless image, you can barely see it, so I didn't process it uh, out. Uh, uh, maybe I should put some more uh, time to it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't know. Everyone, the hot nebula is just stunning. It's fantastic. The core for the for the large telescope and the overall image for the for the wide field setup is such a fantastic target. I, I love this nebula, really. But let's just say this is a dim nebula. This is not very bright. Yeah, yeah. I I also yeah. tried it often before with a with a. Uh, yeah, DSLR camera. Even with a modified camera, it's hard to get any signal on the on the chip. Uh, oh yeah, this is one of my my latest uh, images. This is taken, uh, I think, a month ago. Uh, this is Higson Forty Four uh, Galaxy, also an ARP uh, Galaxy Group ARP Three Sixteen uh, in constellation Leo. Uh, yeah, I just love these uh, different galaxies that are in. In here, this one with this with this dust band before one with this crazy shape, and also this little one here. Unfortunately, I'm not that good in color processing. To be honest, I sometimes I do color photos, but I'm not good at processing. Uh, Jaza take this data set and push the colors so so heavily out of it. Um, so yeah, I'm more for the for the luminance, I think. Um, so what we else have? Yeah, so some some images are still uh, in the pipeline. This is the Elephant Trunk Nebula. This was the first light of my of the seventy six refractor with the ASI two nine four. Oh yeah, by the way, that's an RGB image with the two nine four, but worked really really good. I was happy with it. Oh, just I was gone away. Oops. Just let him in. He's really Yeah, I'm. Oh, cool. You. <laughs> I, I see you. It just started lagging and it just started lagging and I couldn't hear anyone. So. Oh, just... oh, okay. Um, this is also well known. Uh, Messi sixty four, the Black Eye Galaxy. That's also fantastic, and I was super happy about this image because this is exposed. I think an hour or so. This was a real short exposure. And it went out that good, so don't know what to achieve when I'm putting here a whole well, night. What before. camera did you use? The 294? Mm. I would say yes, but to be honest, I'm not sure. Yeah, with, uh, with an hour of integration good. time, I, it must be the 294. That's yeah, that was really nice, nice image. And of course, M81. This was an object where I put some more time. I've just not had a proper exposure of M81, so I had to do this. And this is also not, not that long ago. And this is about four hours, I think, with uh, added H-alpha signal. Yeah, this is always a fantastic uh, fantastic galaxy. Unfortunately, I, I should have re rotated the, the image because this is the full frame of the one si of the 1600 with rotation it would be more convenient to see but yeah uh, the, the flats were prepared everything was prepared so uh wasn't so it I'm, I'm gonna make a quick collimation joke here um <laughs> what's happening with that star at the bottom right i know it's a double star but every time i see that i think like, oh my collimation is <laughs> <up again." laughs> and i also look i look twice at it yes <laughs> exactly yeah, M100, that's just totally... That was also a deep integration, but I'm not happy with it. It was... Here you can definitely see the seeing uh, was not that good. Yeah, but I keep it. I keep it. <laughs> uh, a very rarely seen object. This is Heinz Variable Nebula uh, in Taurus. That's... I'm, I also like dust clouds, but I'm not... Uh, I, I just can't process it pretty good, so uh, I have to spend more time to it, more integration time, because this was also really too short, way too short. It starts to become noisy here. Uh, but a super cool target with, with a deep integration, that would be really, really nice. For two hours, I think you got really, really good detail. 
Yeah. Not yeah. A really from a, a, a decent. Two hours, yeah. Correct. And not la not the last uh, one to go. N NGC two, four, or three. Yeah. And okay, my last one depletes with with the also with the small refractor plates are always a stunning target i, I still love the this concert or this, this this cluster i have often photographed it by but i still love it always a pleasure to see how much data do you have here at first mm, yeah <laughs> just a moment just a moment I'm also not that good in, in ordering my data. This uh, is uh, 32 by 4 minutes, okay. something like three uh, hours? nearly 3 hours, yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's from me. Who's next? Peter? Have you something to, to share? I do, yeah. Let's, let me try and let me try and share screen. Um, okay, can you see? Yeah, cool. We we all don't know these objects because we, <laughs> we can't see them live. Well, so yeah, we so, about them as well. Yeah. A real favorite of mine, the uh, the tarantula nebula. Um, so this is a bicolor, O3 and um, an HA, and taken with the the Rasa. So I spent, you know, last year I spent a lot of time using the Rasa and focusing a lot of my efforts on uh, a narrow band. Uh, so this was one of the the first objects I took with uh, with the Rasa 8 8 inch. Um, and here we have an example. This is the, the running chicken nebula. Um, example taken with the, the Samyong 135 millimeter. So this is the kind of field of view you get with that, with that camera, which is really quite remarkable. So you, you know, with, a, with the Rasa 8, you'd, you'd just about fit the, the object in, but with the Samyong, you, you really get that bigger wider wider field so this was um, a Hubble palette image that I took with with the Samyong le uh, lens um, and I think it came out quite well um, it's a really challenging target mm. this is uh, a dolphin head nebula um, so this is visible in your skies um, really challenging for two reasons the first is it's incredibly faint uh, most of the data is in O3. Um, then we have this nasty star, which you know, I managed to remove the halo, but it took a huge amount of effort. There's still a little bit of the halo left, um, but it took a lot of effort removing it, um, and, and it, uh, it is quite a problematic, uh, problematic star. Um, but uh, and it was also quite late in the season. Um, it was it was heading. Heading west, and I just about gathered enough a, enough data to to get an image out. Um, I think it was about it was about uh, twelve hours of data with again with the Rasa eight eight inch. Um, then the Centaurus say so. This was an image I, I captured with the the Edge HD. Um, it's about uh, 12 hours data um, with the um, 1600 NC. So it's a camera, quite an old camera now, uh, one shot color, but um, I still use it a lot and it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's got a you know, nice small pixels, uh, it's nice, uh, reasonably small pixels. And, uh, and I find the bidding two by two with the edge um, is kind of the sweet spot uh, with uh, capturing galaxies with that tele with that camera and, and with, with that particular telescope um, uh, so then another favorite galaxy of mine m83 
Um, so again, about 12 hours of data. What I really want to, I want to go back to this galaxy and and uh, capture some HA because I, you know, although I've got some of the the um, the, the hydrogen dense regions coming out here in, in red, um, it would look a lot better with uh, with, with the added um, hydrogen alpha. So uh, you know, I want to gather some more data this year on M83 and uh, and try and try and do a better job. Also, luminance, I didn't capture any luminance data either. On this galaxy. Um, so again, this was the um, the sixteen hundred MC camera. Um, so another favorite of mine, the fighting dragons uh, of Ara, um, Hubble palette. Again, taken with the the Rasa, the Rasa eight inch, um, and this was about fifteen hours of data. Um, And uh, Statue of Liberty um, Nebula, um, uh, bicolor. So I'd like to go back and, and try and finish that finish that uh, that image and, and, and do a help do a Hubble palette. Uh, didn't really get round to it uh, last last year. Um, and again captured with the the Rasa eight. What uh, filters do you use for narrowband uh, for this, Peter? Which narrow? It, it's the um, the beta um, high speed filters. Yeah, I was gonna say because Raza doesn't work with anything, uh, everything, sir. I mean, it's 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 nice taking to so all these narrowband images are are typically around fifteen hours. Now, fifteen hours at f two. It's a, it's a nice it's nice it's a nice quantity of data and you can then be quite selective in terms of the frames that you you end up keeping and that's one of the, the beauties of, of of that that type of telescope is you can take a ton of data and then you can just go through very very selectively and pick out the best frames to combine uh, cat's core nebula um, again, by color with with, uh, with the Rasa. And the War and Peace, um, again, in by color. So a lot of these by color images, I need to go back and, mm -hmm. and capture the, the sulfur uh, to, to, to get the um, Hubble palettes completed. Have you tried North. making a synthetic green channel? To make a Hubble palette. Yeah, I've, I've played around a little bit with that, um, with varying success. I haven't quite mastered that uh, that that aspect of the processing, but I've seen other people do it with uh, with varying uh, levels of success. So it's, it's certainly worth trying. Um, yeah, and, and then yeah. And then, the, and then the prawn, prawn nebula here. Uh, so I, I did play around a little bit with the colors. I mean, normally this would be sort of more bluish color, but I actually quite like the green. Um, just to, to Is it because it. it's more scientifically accurate? Let's, <laughs> let me just make that joke because we hear it all the time. Why is it green? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what I liked about this image were, you know, the 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 you know the, the sort of dark bands that the sort of dust that dusky bands that, that came out rather well in this image. Um, and then uh, yeah, another another favorite, uh, um, a sculpture galaxy. Um, would like to go back and again capture some HA data for this and, is, some, and some some luminance. Is this also with the HHD? This is yeah with the uh, the um, the HHD yeah yeah yeah. And then for the first time, I tried to do some high magnification lunar stuff, but I'd not I'd not tried this before. Um, so I went and got myself a, a, a um, two times Barlow, and so image this is four hundred four thousand millimeters with the HHD. Um, and you know, I was, I was 
quite happy with what came out. It was really my first attempt at doing any kind of, of, of lunar photography, any kind of planetary photography. And uh, I learned very quickly that planetary photography is a whole different mm. art form. It's a whole, you know, completely different challenge, cha uh, challenges. And in many respects, um, more difficult than deep sky, I think, um, to get it right. Yeah. Normally, okay, also, oh. what camera did you use here? So th this was just the, um, the again, the, the, the 1600 MC. So not the highest frame rate. So I had to work quite hard to get enough frames, but uh, it came out okay. Um, Helix Nebula. Uh, so again, also just uh, just the bicolor here, yeah, not the um, the uh, full narrow band, uh, not, not the full double palette. I uh, did. I didn't really get enough. Uh, you know, I really would like to spend maybe 20, 25, 30 hours on this on this target because um, you you get this sh the shell extends all the way around, um, and if you do it properly, you know, it, you you get that sort of bubble effect that you don't see in most uh, most images of, of the helix. Um, um, then I spent, you know, with the the uh, 61 EDPH, I, I spent uh, um, the first few few images I, I, I captured with that telescope was uh, in the, the Vela um, supernova remnant uh, part of the sky region, um, and uh, and this was taken with the um, an extreme filter um, and the uh, 1600 MC. So I'd, I mean, I'd love to get my hands on on you know some of the newer cameras, you know, like the the you know the 2600, for example. Um, you have to work quite hard with the 1600, you know, just to get enough data. But you know, I still you know. As a you know, entry level color camera, so, you know, it's a, it's still a pretty pretty good camera to, it's, to have. It, it's a myth, I think, Peter. I have a Radium Quad filter in a two six eight QHY, and after eight hours on a bright target, it's still it's really not comparable to mono. I, I hate to say this on a on an open call, but <laughs> yeah, mono is kind of king and. One shot color is amazing for one shot color targets, but the moment, even the most expensive filter on the market is not comparable to a one shot, to a mono with nanoband filtering. Well, I completely agree, but it's a, it's a issue of time. It's always, you know, if you've got the, the do a narrowband, narrowband filter, um, and also if you've got the, you know, generally well, I'll have the, the mono camera working on something else, you know, so I don't really have any option other than if I want to do narrowband, then I have to combine the one shot color with uh, with a dual narrowband. Um, but yes, I agree. I agree. Mono is is, is definitely preferable. Um, and then uh, the Orion Nebula. I've, I've finally managed to get some time to do a, a decent job um, of it. That, you know, get an image I was I was, I was happy with. Um, And then another part of the, the Vela region. And then um, you know, the, probably the most famous object in the southern sky, Eta, the Eta Carina Nebula. Uh, so this, uh, this was actually a combination of dual narrowband data and also color data. So I had, you know, this was taken with a 294 MC uh, with um, first of all with the um, the L Pro no the um, the Alan Hans filter and then I captured some color data with the L Pro filter and then just add, you know re re replace the narrowband stars with 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 uh, with um, col true color stars and then. You know, again with with another image of the uh, Carina Nebula, this time with the 
the uh, Samyong um, one three one three five. So again, you know, you get this um, sort of panorama shot, which you don't get, you know, with the uh, with a longer focal length telescope. But yeah, you know, like Jan said, you know, I, I I really love this lens. It's it's really fantastic, and also on you know a lightweight mount you know, like the the um, the Star Adventurer, it worked really really well. And you can just throw it into the back of your car, head off, set it up quickly, grab some some images in a dark site in a dark uh, sky location, and uh, that makes it a really powerful versatile um, package, I think. Okay, so that's, uh, that's me. Wow, really fantastic images, Peter. Um, uh, that reminds me that uh, Bernhard asked us to meet at the Oktoberfest at Munich, but I would suggest we met in South Africa, that we have also the opportunity to see this incredible sky. I would be completely lost, <laughs> but... <laughs> These objects are fantastic. It's yeah, still uh, something totally uh, different for us here on the northern hemisphere. It's great. As long as one of us brings the RC first, then I'm down for it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'll, I'll we need, we need the RC. Before the, yeah. before the COVID, uh, I was thinking of visiting uh, Namibia. Yeah, which is which is Me too, which yeah. is in, it has incredible skies and th there's many astro farms where you can yeah. rent an equipment so you might be able to rent an rc <laughs> <laughs> that's right but it's super uh, i planned this uh, but it's super difficult to to get a time slot with no mu no moon and in yeah not the rain uh, period there that's super hard uh, you need well, at least a year in, in advance in, in namibia you know places like the northern cape and namibia basically you have you know more than 250 clear skies <laughs> a year right so it's not going to be too difficult finding a time slot and yeah, even in okay. cape town where where the weather is not particularly great we get more than you know more than i would say 180 clear nights a year really so, whoa Okay. Uh, in Germany, as for this year, I had I think four clear nights so far. <laughs> okay, <laughs> unbelievable. Okay, uh, Jaja, are you still with us? Yeah. Your, your, your image is shaking sometimes. Um, I I hope the connection stays. Yeah, it's pretty bad here. I don't know why. Okay. The board just, meetings, there's always connection bad. Just give it a try. Right, so, yeah. Um, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, yeah, here's my are my photos. Naming um, a folder a port is not oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This was the this was the um the Can young. Just the young astrophotographer of the year competition which i um just okay. downloaded all the photos um so here's the first one with the um 61 edph and the large pollution filter um because i live in the vault of seven uh, it was quite necessary um but i stopped using it because um, the star colors as you can see i have done a lot of masks on the stars here Hmm. just to get them good good colors um but it's still pretty um like smudgy like the orange is smudgy um so i recently sold my outro filter and i'm shooting without it now um yeah so this is andromeda galaxy more about, very well known um right now this is the evolve scanner okay Cave Nebula um, shot with uh, Nikon D five hundred and thirty five hundred um, on a dark sky with my old Newtonian telescope. Um, I will come back to this target this year hopefully, and I'll shoot some H alpha on it because if I'm not wrong, here's a small planetary nebula in very dim though, but it is and a large 
like an H of a curve here around the nebula. And the, uh, I was planning also uh, to like, doing this of white field. Um, of course, when I first got the uh, apochromatic refractor, so the 61 dph, I was also I started playing uh, mosaics, of course, and th this would be a part of it where I would take like H alpha signal. Um, I know that Jason Gwen. Genzel, the diva stretches on Instagram has done an incredible job on it. Uh, he got a lot of age alpha around here, so yeah. Um, then the next one is the Boogeyman Nebula. Um, this was the first time I shot without the filter in Boto 7. Um, you can see the signal was pretty weak, so I had to do a lot of noise reduction. But the 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 main object in here is quite vis visible here. Um, here is a small part of the Barnard's loop, and right on the other side of it, it's M87, no, 78, uh, which is like very well, very well known target. Um, this was also taken with the 6180dph and the 294MC Pro camera. Um, Next one, oh, here's the HDR moon that I shot. Um, I think it was with the 224MC Pro camera. No, not the Pro, uh, it's a planetary camera. Um, and the uh, 61dph, and I also did the HDR edit, so you can see the, the moon phase was actually like this, but I blended it in the full moon, so it looks more, how can I say, it? more um, artistic, or, yeah. It's also as long as there's no stars in there. So. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's also I added some colors to it, so it has like blue um, seas on it, and um, I I have some some trouble doing here the colors because you can see um, this part of the moon isn't actually colored like that, but I I don't know what what happened. Alright, um, this is the M13 globular cluster. Um, this was shot with the ZWO 174M super cool camera, which I hate. <laughs> um, it's very noisy, and I just, I, you can see, I did a small noise reduction on my star cluster, which is kind of a bad thing to do. But I was happy that I got to reveal the galaxies like this one, and here's another small mm -hmm. one. Uh, during the full moon, and this is only around th three hours of data. Uh, and yeah, of course, the are uh, the things that the doublet leaves are like halos around the stars, and I also saturated them, like you can see in the middle that they're blown out. Also, the cluster is blown out because of the low QE of the camera. Uh, oh yeah, this was also with the 61dph, and the framing is pretty um, narrow due to the small field, to the small uh, sensor size of the um, 174MC cool camera. But yeah, um, I had problems with the 294MC Pro that when I and I also figured out what was it, um, so I had to shoot with this camera for my teacher. Yeah, so um, I I got something to do. Oh, <laughs> this was more of an experimental um, thing. Um, this is the M35 cluster with another small one here. And of course, I had to add the um, star spikes here. This was the only image in my whole um, gallery on Instagram, which is more than 200 photos that has artificial spikes on it. Uh, but it gives something of like a special thing. So to did you watch. add these in like, post processing, or did you put some wire on your telescope? How did you do no, that? No, <laughs> no, please, no, no wires above uh, app uh, refractor. <laughs> no, not this. <laughs> processing because you can see that um, there are three. Um... Yeah, this was just like yeah. Um, and there, here's my probably my best photo ever. Um, this is the Orion Nebula and the uh, NGC 1999 here in the on the right. 
Um, this was also shot in Alpro filter. Um, and also just four hours of data. Um, and you can see the orange stars here are just looking white, which is, this is the main reason that I saw the filter. Um, and I also messed up the core here. You can see it's just white all over it. Um, this has got blown out pretty fast because the 61 ADPH is f4.5, which is pretty fast for such a bright object. Um, and I was also impressed on how much of the surrounding nebulae I got, um, even though it's just four hours of data. And is that also Bordel 8 or? Yeah, this is Bordel 7, yeah. With an app pro, oh, so really it cool helped then. a little bit. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the F2, the, um, the this is... F2 is also really challenging, you know, because of the core. You, 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 yeah, know, you have to core, take super just... short exposures. Yeah. Um, and then do an HDR. I was planning on doing it, but yeah, yeah, I was planning on doing the HDR on it, but this winter was just thing that. Actually, um, I would make a case for Photoshop on that one, just because HDR doesn't always do it right. Just take the same, align them, put them in Photoshop, and draw a mask, and then just use, use a brush, a soft brush around it, and it, it's a lot easier than trying to use the HDR. Uh, well, yeah, the HDR in Pix Insight is, is, is not really great. And also the M42 has uh, two little stars. So when you when you shoot uh, like really quick, short exposures, you don't have enough stars uh, for the Pix Insight to align it to the long exposure image. So the Photoshop is much easier to, way to go. Yeah, I'll ask one of you two to help me with it because Photoshop is uh, a mystery to me, especially the masks and stuff like that. Um, so let's move on. This is the M44 cluster, the Heath cluster. Um, it's I was I was surprised at how big it is um, because this was shot with the two uh, with a 61 EDPH two, like the same telescopes as before, and the this was only cropped a little bit on the side, um, but I think that the small sensor of the 174 helped a lot with it. Um, and I think I also got some, ga yeah, you can see a galaxy here. It's a small one, but it is there, uh, which is also shot during the full moon and a short exposure time. So I tried to get the best out of it. Uh, yeah, this is the also the shot that I'm very very proud of um this is the leo triplet here uh you can see a lot of dust specks here around it because this is the reason of overexposing the background in the Borsa 7 without the filter um, i was doing two minute subs but i think it helped with the tail here because you can see the hamburger galaxy has a star stream around here around it um, probably because of interaction with the M65 um, in the past. Um, I, I had some um, trouble um, making it more visible here. Um, so I had to do a, a lot of masks and fix inside to uh, enhance it a bit. Uh, if I wouldn't do that, I'll probably just put a bit of it here. But in that way, I got the whole tail here, which I'm really proud of. Um, and of course, a lot of galaxies in the background, you can see a lot here and a lot of noise re star reduction artifacts also here. I need to learn how to do it properly. Uh, and all, I was for this to even attempt this photo, I was um, um, impressed by the image of Mark Hansen, uh, which has like uh, dreamlike setup in Chile or some, somewhere and he got even the details in this part which is the brightest one he got the details so I just had to sh try it and I think I did a pretty good job on it I think you did a great job for the light pollution you're in and uh, that, that we're dealing with so never say you know other people yeah, create better I think, I think that results in the desert but... yeah well, for this for this photo, I did around eleven dBEs in Pix Insight because of the <laughs> gradient with the light pollution. <laughs> yeah, it was it was bad, but 
I got a final photo here, so it's good. Um, I don't know what, how can you see it, but yeah, uh, this is the M27, one of the first lights with my camera. Uh, so the, the 294M Pro and the uh, enhanced filter. Um, this was also shot with my old 8-inch Newtonian telescope, so F5. And you can see a lot of um, the star colors are bad because I didn't shoot RGB, so they're mostly blue. And this one in here is still red. Um, yeah, uh, and I also want to do an HDR on it because you can see the pics inside HDR does a very bad job. Um, doing it properly did you uh did you use a mask and did you because you can do a mask and and increase yeah, the number mask. of iterations yeah i did a mask but it just didn't help this this nebula is pretty bright and i also did like i think i think i did five minute subs so yeah, yeah. And, uh, are, are you using pix insights uh hdr composition or a multilinear transform or I use scale, for this so. one I use the MMT so the multi something yes. um, <laughs> but I yeah um, but for the future projects that I'll shoot like Orion or anything bright um, I'll use the R HDR composition or Photoshop like you two are recommended no don't use Photoshop um, I'll see please. what will work the best but just for the <laughs> HDR composition use Photoshop yeah I, I guess yeah, you could. Okay. I'll I'll just experiment as best as I can. Um, and for this photo, I was proud of myself because I got the beautiful um, we have um, wings of the um, Dumbbell Nebula here, uh, with only twelve hours of, of data at ten nanometers of H alpha and fourteen of O three. So, yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. And this is probably the last one, and um, this is one of my latest processes of it. Um, I I actually shot this target with my friend on a dark sky uh, with a Space Cat fifty one, and I um, loved it. This is I think only three hours of data of Alan Hans and one hour for RGB stars. You can see the colors are um, good ones. Jata, is this a mosaic or is it a single shot? Oops. I believe. I it sounds a bit behind it. Yeah, can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, is this a mosaic or a single shot? No, this is a single shot uh, with the Space Cat 51, which has a bit lower uh, focal length than the 16 ah, APH. Okay. Um, so okay. the Space Cat has 250 millimeters. Um, and yeah, I I basically could have a better result, uh, but we both of us forget the guiding setup, so <laughs> we are limited on one minute subs. Um, but yeah, I think I managed to get the most out of it. Um, yeah, your, yeah, your Pickering triangle looks stunning. Yeah, um, it's pretty noisy. Or these stars, I don't know. Yes, I think it's noise. Um, and also this part here, which is also pretty um, dim to get. That was also. So, if you think about it, when we image with the Ricci Cretian, you only see half of the broomstick, and the star <laughs> in the middle is so bright that it creates reflections all over yeah. the image. So exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is suffering from this, different this problems. Is the main, <laughs> this is the main reason why this part of the whale nebula is like the worst one for me. I like this one, the Pickering triangle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the lower part of the, the whale network nebula, nebula, I think it's the, called. This right? one is awesome. What? The network nebula. I think it's called the network nebula, I think. I don't know. I think the network is the cluster, and this is the bat nebula, I think. Okay. If we turn it around. It's, yeah, I don't know. You can call it whatever you want. I think it's East Whale Nebula, the bottom one. Or right now it's the top one. <laughs> and the Bat Nebula no, is just know. part of it. Yeah, I think that the, the Bat Nebula is the, this, the big, the white part of it. And then this is just something. Um, so yeah, 
you can google it later <laughs> <laughs> yeah great great work so far uh, um yeah i think this is did i show you this one yet yeah i think we're around okay yeah. now this is all from my side great work so far and i'm looking really forward to your images with the with the six inch ts photon if you can manage this one it would be great yeah, because uh, this uh, so you nice. you sent me uh, pictures from that sixty one EDPH uh, some time ago, and this was really awkward. This this offset in the in the filter in the in the color channels, this is really not not usable for for serious photos. Oh, the for the with the dual band filter like the the channels from the star. Yeah, the, the, this yeah. this focus difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was talking you, with Yo Yo Yohan a bit later, and he told me to like remove the stars from the image because the yeah. uh, actual photo is in focus, but just the stars mm. are the ones that um, so it doesn't look you good. can you can go around it a little bit. Them. You can go around it a little bit when you have uh, RGB image. You can uh, you can uh, take extract each channel and then realign it uh, to each other. And you can use this distortion correction, and it should reduce the stars a little bit, and it should help. But it's not going to be the best. Yeah. So I I was working on that, and I was talking to Jason about it, and he told me how to do it, and because he has that Im incredible image he took of the rosette with a, a quad filter, and what happens is red has really beautiful stars, but green and blue is really bad. So. I, I just removed the green and blue and just left the red stars in there. In the future, I'll add the RGB stars. So it's art. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks. Um, yeah. I think there's no there are no more questions rolling in. Um, I think, and we are talking about for two and a half hours now. Um, I would suggest we uh, we stop it slowly and maybe if you want to and if the viewers want to we can repeat this at some time um, we started this as a full moon session maybe we can repeat it under, under another full moon that would be I, so I would appreciate it I found it a cool format uh, to share some experience um, maybe we can then also focus on a specific topic not what's the best telescope or something uh something more specific uh yeah it, it would be cool to see how we we all image how we all kind of what's our process how do you start stuff how do you get us up and then maybe in the future talk about processing but okay this, is, this has been great yeah yeah sure we can do this I'm really okay. happy how it turned out. Uh, I would suggest maybe we could do, since we all use Instagram, we could do uh, polls. What would people like yeah. to like to see, like to hear? Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. I think also uh, Instagram has such a large outreach to people that this is a good platform for that. So uh, we we can. I'm interested, I can I can share a quick. Um, picked a sort of view from my obs cam which is oh. peeking down on, on on the observatory so i can sure i can quickly share that if you'd like to see it uh, so that's that's the, the observatory what i'm what i'm going to do now Let's just open. Press the button. Press the button. <laughs> Fantastic! I love such uh, such surveillance cameras. How is that not automated? Because you can make somebody press that button remotely. So when you're in a different part of the country, just get a little thing to press it. So I mean, the automation at the moment is this, mm -hmm. but hopefully by next week it'll be via um, sequence generator pro as well <laughs> cool. as, yeah. as, a, as a remote yeah. that's great that's <laughs> that's pretty cool mm -hmm. <laughs> how long is the distance from where you're sitting now to the to the observatory it's about uh, 10 meters ah okay okay all all in view <laughs> perfect 
perfect. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, we can stick a minute longer here in, in Zoom, but I will just uh, give a shout out to, to the remaining watchers. Uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us that long and for your participation also in the chat. If we missed something, um, don't hesitate to, to drop us a comment under the video. It will be shared then later on here on YouTube, of course, for that you can review it if you want. And yeah, we are looking forward to the next session and for new information, new images. So for now, thank you very much. Have a nice evening, a nice week, and yeah, bye bye. Everybody. Yes. Bye. bye. Oh, you're an actual left. So. <laughs>